coming. Um, my brief is quite simple, as you have been told. Uh, it is really to talk about how this book has come about. Um, I understand that in the media nowadays it's been called the backstory of, of, of things. What's the story behind uh, the story? Um, so I'll be quite brief uh, because I'm not, other people will talk about the content, I'll just talk about the process. Um, this book originated from two related observations or situations some, some months ago. One of those, and some of my age mates and peers and those people who might also be older than you appreciate, is the difficulty that we find ourselves in having political conversation with young people. Because for some reason that I may not understand very well, um, our politics has been denuded of historical context. So we are discussing contemporary politics, but the young people who are the majority in the country do not have a historical context of where we are, where we are, and why we fight for the things that we do. So, for people like me, I realized uh, not too long ago that uh, Saba Saba is, is not history, which has just passed. It's a contemporary event because we were there. Uh, but for 27 years ago, for more than half of our adult population, is a very long time ago. They were either children or not born. Uh, so for them that's history, but it hasn't made the history books yet. So there's a gap and that uh, the, the very important political context uh, is missing from the discourse and we're expecting young people to participate in politics without understanding where we are coming from and therefore lacking a good sense of being able to make uh, the informed choices that we think that they should. So questions like, what is this second liberation that you people talk, keep talking about? Yeah? And what is your beef with uh, Uhuruto? They're just nice, political, you know, good, you know, sort of tech-savvy digital politicians. Um, and what is this thing you keep calling status quo? You know, what is this status quo you talk about? For many of the young people, uh, they, they have no idea what those things are because they, they are yet to make it to study, subjects of study, because they are still very contemporary. Yet these are very significant events uh, informing our contemporary politics. The second dimension of, of that story is that many people, especially in recent years, know that uh, our presidential candidate, and our president hopefully from, most certainly from the ninth, uh, travels abroad a lot. And when he goes abroad, we know that he goes to give speeches and lectures. We see him, like we saw him the other day uh, at the Wailing War, uh, where he had gone to give uh, a lecture at some uh, very important think tank in, in Israel. But, we do not know, many people do not know what he goes there to talk about. Yeah, because the things he says there are not conveyed uh, back here. Uh, and uh, if you are invited time and again to go and speak to the world's premier universities and think tanks, obviously you must have something of intellectual value to say. Those are not places where you go to give this kind of uh, sort of uh, cut and paste speeches that uh, are given in uh, sort of uh, various uh, uh, local forums. Uh, there must be some intellectual, something of intellectual value which people expect you to share. So in a sense, you need to have something between your ears to, to, to be invited in that place. And many people, other than those of us who uh, interact with uh, our presidential candidate, regularly and at that level uh, really do not know that he is a person who thinks very deeply about uh, the issues confronting the country 
other than just doing something about them. He actually thinks very deeply and has thought about them very deeply for a very long time. Uh, has got very clear ideas uh, uh, about some very radical ideas on some things, for instance, which are in that book. And you do not know it until you challenge him on some of those things. Uh, that uh, he has some very, very strong and very informed and very well thought out views uh, about many of our issues. So, um, we felt, some of the people around, uh, as we approached this campaign, that uh, there are many young people out there who would benefit from merging these two uh, stories, understanding uh, these issues from his perspective, uh, as one of the people who has probably thought uh, more deeply and longer about these issues than many of us, as well as providing historical context uh, to the politics. And that, that was the easy part. The difficult part was actually to take a lot of that material from his speeches, some of it from conversations, uh, and uh, also from the historical material, and to synthesize that material into uh, something that would be, in our view, hopefully interesting and engaging and accessible to our young people. If we were to do this for sort of the reading intellectual academic audiences, it wouldn't be that difficult because that uh, the language for doing that is quite easy uh, and we're used to it. But do it uh, with the ambition that it should be a book that will be read perhaps even by high school students uh, was a very challenging thing to do. Uh, we hope that we have gone some way in achieving that. As you can see from the format of the book, we have tried to make it look very user-friendly. Uh, we appreciate that our children nowadays uh, have, don't have much patience for things longer than 140 characters. So we are trying to meet them halfway. And, uh, uh, we, 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 I'm sure it's quite a challenge, uh, but uh, from the fe little feedback we have, we, we feel that uh, we're confident that we've gone some way in, in achieving that. So on my part, uh, as uh, one of the people who uh, have worked on this project and then sort of uh, put some of the ideas together, I wish to thank uh, our presidential candidate very much for availing both his time and uh, material in the middle of a campaign to be able to actually see uh, this uh, project uh, through and all, uh, giving it a lot of support. Uh, I wish to thank my uh, co-conspirators on this uh, project, that is Dennis Onyango in particular, uh, who has written most of the uh, speeches uh, that uh, our presidential candidate has been making in, in, in recent past. Um, I have uh, woken up several occasionally by Dennis to find him some data on the, the progress in, 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 in reducing malaria, for instance, because it is required for, for some such uh, presentation somewhere. Uh, and also Sarah Elakin, who is, uh, she's not here, I wish she was, because she is a fantastic editor. I have written a lot for many years, but quite frankly, I have not uh, seen editorial work uh, of the quality that uh, Sarah has put uh, into, uh, into this uh, book. Uh, there are many other people I wish to thank because uh, he probably would not have the opportunity to have some of the thanking our publisher, uh, Lawrence Njagi, uh, who also has been uh, easier. He will, I think, have an opportunity to say a thing or two at some point. But I wish to thank him very much for the production work he has done as has, has splendid. Uh, production job, uh, and also all those people who have participated in many ways in organizing this event and the process. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I believe that uh, as we get this uh, book out uh, more, I think the youth of, of this country will really appreciate uh, everything that everybody uh, involved in this has done. Uh, however big, um, however little. So thank you very much, uh, and I uh, hope you uh, really enjoy the rest of the evening.
Santo, 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 Santo. Asante sana daktari as you have had the challenge for many young people like myself is to understand how the past struggles that uh, uh, Honorable Raila Odinga has led relate to today. I was telling the story of uh, Sabasaba when we were at uh, Sabasaba just recently. I was telling them that when the first Sabasaba happened, I was only seven years old. So you can see <laughs> that for us, we need all these things to be put in perspective. And uh, to do just that, we have some young people here who need uh, to explain or to tell us their perspectives on the book, having had an opportunity to go through it. We would like to see the world through the eyes of young people and the challenges that they face today. So we have a few uh, young people, I will call them in order. Uh, please just come and share your perspectives on the book. We will start with uh, the lovely Angel Mbuthia, who's here with us. Please come to the stage. Asante sana. Honorable Raila Mutinga, uh, Honorable Musalia Mujabati, and Honorable Kanlonzo Musioka, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. In those documentaries, you guys look more handsome. <laughs> also, when you, when, for us young people, um, um, the beginning, the, the struggle for this country, what we see is in documentaries and we imagine all that. And when you're going for trials and all that, people look more handsome. I just say more handsome. <laughs> Please mark my words. Yes, and. Um, Mine will come from, um, from, uh, from, uh, from something on economy and agriculture. And here in this book, Honorable Raila Dinga talks about his view on agriculture and why we are stagnating. And I'll pick an excerpt from that. Uh, the dominant role that manufacture, manufacturing has historically played in the process of economic development has overshadowed and often led to the neglect of agriculture. Yet agriculture has always been central to social economic transformation. Agriculture remains our leading export sector to the global market. We are the leading exporter of black tea and one of the leading sources of fresh produce to the European market. In much of the rest of the developing world, export agriculture is plantation-based, typically controlled by large multinational corporations. One of the attractive aspects of our export agriculture is that it is predominantly a smaller, a smallholder economy. The tea industry direct, directly affects, supports more than 500,000 smaller smallholder farmers. Sorry, it is its net worth that central Kenya, where export agriculture is concentrated, has also higher average incomes and a lower incidence of poverty. By contrast. The, imp the import substituting sugar industry has not brought propensity to Western Kenya, even with the subsidies and protection from imports. This demonstrates that the case for export orientation vis-a-vis -vis import substitution is not limited to manufacturing. Agriculture production is of course limited by the avail availability of arable land, and it is doubtful that we can continue expanding tea production much longer without eating into our forests. That said, there is still considerable scope to expand, export agriculture. Most of Western Kenya, for example, enjoys a climate ideal for horticulture. The eastern lowlands and the coast are suitable for fruits. Currently, a lot of mangoes produced there go to waste every year. Our coffee production has declined from 130,000 tons at its peak in the late 80s to less than 50,000 50, tons today. Contrary to a popular view, the conversion of coffee plantations has contributed little to this decline. The main cause is, is not botched reforms and corruption, in short, cartels. 
And we messed up the coffee industry just as the global demand for high quality products and such as we produce are sticking off 